didn't realize how good the school is. If I if I knew that, I'd stay here for a full week. So this lecture is based on a series of papers uh, which you can find uh, online. Uh, the functional point of view of dynamical mean field theory and combination against the functional theory uh, started with this Rabbi Potter physics from 2006. Uh, it's supposed to be relatively easy to read. Uh, then uh, this um, real space embedding projection that I'm going to uh, spend lots of time talking about uh, and its implementation is in this PRB from 2010. Then there are several papers in the theory disorders section. This is a very active uh, area of research. Uh, almost every year there's at least a paper or two of improving the theory disorders, which is actually a very important area. If you want to do DMFT well, you rather have better theory disorders every year. And so there are some papers here that I gave which are in mind, but there are some many, many others. Uh, some discussion about screening of interaction, which I think is a very important area, and so we, should, we, should, we should do more about this. I think that this is actually a weak point of the full theory. It's, uh, it's, it's really missing. A good theory of screening is on it. And then uh, some recent papers about stationarity of free energy, because if you want to use this for structural optimization that is uh, done with the density functional theory so well, we want to have implementation of this theory uh, from the functional point of view, so that the small error in, in density or in fringe function does not change uh, a lot uh, free energy. So we want to have special energy presentation. And uh, also double bonding issues we've discussed here extensively, and we have not a good way of uh, estimating the exact double counting between the methods. Now, uh, implementation, now if you're, if you're interested in <coughs> trying it out yourself, you might just download something and learn. Uh, now the DFT code that we are using is win 2 k and um, uh, actually it's very easy to, to, to learn win 2 k and the way we are interfacing this with DMFT is that you don't need to do anything special with win 2 k actually, actually we are calling win 2 k uh, some steps from win 2 k from time to time. So it's, uh, the code is independent of win 2 k but it, it needs Win2K okay as implement as uh, in your system, so that you can call it. You can call a few steps of Win2K. Okay. Now, the dynamical mean field theory uh, part was developed at Rutgers. Uh, you can download it from here. Um, there are also some tutorials that were written by uh, 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 by uh, uh, Turan Birol, who was actually a student here. And uh, I know that this is way not good enough. So it's very hard to learn just from these tutorials. We need to, we need to uh, uh, do much better in future. And uh, actually, we have some uh, new openings for postdocs uh, for developing new software. Actually, it's a big grant from DOE. And if you're interested in working on this, uh, send me an email to uh, Rutgers Applications at Gmail, uh, and you can uh, you can apply. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> just briefly about latest developments, as I, as I mentioned, the stationarity of the free energy is actually very important. Here are some examples of how we calculate with, uh, with uh, LDA plus DMFT the equilibrium volume for simple systems such as uh, iron oxide, for example. Uh, we get very, very good agreement with the experiment for the PV phase diagram. And also for systems such as cerium, where actually the entropy the entropy is very, very important for a structural transition. Actually, it turns out if you don't include the, the electronic entropy, you get completely wrong uh, phase diagram. So we can actually look at the phase diagram at finite temperature, including electronic entropy with this method. Um, now, um, uh, here are, here, here's a little bit of advertisement, what one can do uh, with this method, uh, and some of our uh, work, recent and less recent work. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, method is a, metal is a rate of transition in our iron oxide. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice story when we work on this. Uh, experimentalist uh, Kenny Ohta from Japan was visiting, and he was showing us this crazy results on iron oxide that actually gets uh, metallic at high temperature uh, without uh, changing the structure. And that, of course, didn't agree with the density functional theory. So he thought that this data is garbage. But then we showed him our calculation, which actually agreed very well. So <laughs> we immediately 
uh, wrote a paper on it. And then, uh, actually, the Earth's core condition uh, is very hard for, uh, for experiments. So actually, resistivity to the Earth core is still a very important uh, issue, which we recently wrote a paper in Nature, because it turns out that uh, in order to sustain uh, dynamo in Earth's core, you have to have res uh, relatively large resistivity, which is uh, actually coming at least a quarter of the resistivity comes from electron-electron interaction, not just the electron phonon. Even though the temperature is extremely high, it turns out that the metal never ceases to remain quantum mechanical. So the metal, as long as it's a metal, uh, it's quantum mechanical. You cannot uh, neglect resistivity due to electron-electron interaction. Uh, there are several other issues that we were very interested in. For example, the heavy fermions uh, are, can be very nicely uh, simulated with this. Uh, we discussed the hidden order in uranium-2 silicon-2, <coughs> and we predicted uh, back in 2009 that this is actually hexadecapolar order. And recently, uh, uh, Bloomberg uh, used Raman spectroscopy and uh, proved that actually uh, the hexadecapolar order uh, leads to something that we call chiral density wave. So it turns out that, uh, uh, well, at least we have not smoking gun, but, well, we have smoking gun, not direct proof, which needs to be done by, uh, by the X-ray really measuring a chiral density wave. But <clears throat> at least we have from, uh, from uh, round spectroscopy pretty good, um, uh, let's say, smoking gun experiment for this, for this uh, theory. Uh, there are other, many other things that we were interested in, in particular, uh, charge dynamics and spin dynamics in our nictites. <clears throat> if I had time at the end of the day, I might show you some of the prediction for the, uh, uh, for the neutron uh, scattering. So neutron, neutron four factor and neutron uh, uh, scattering, elastic and inelastic, can be predicted with this theory. And actually, it works pretty well. Whenever we compare to uh, Pencheng Dai's neutron scattering, uh, it was, the agreement was pretty fantastic. So, uh, we can do even those materials which are very hard to do neutron scattering. We can simulate them. Uh, okay, so uh, very, very quick, quick introduction. So we know uh, basic laws of quantum mechanics were written down a long time ago by uh, Schrodinger and Dirac. And uh, at the time, Dirac was very optimistic about solving the, uh, uh, the problem of everything. But of, we, have the, we have the equation and we have, we have the, the Hamiltonian. So why it's so hard to solve? And as everybody in the Sony just knows, that because the uh, perturbation theory does not work because kinetic energy and potential energy are of the same order of magnitude. Uh, and direct numerical approaches are usually uh, also very, very hard because we have so called sign problem, which is NP hard. So the direct approaches uh, uh, are, are usually not, not possible. So in this case, <clears throat> we're looking for indirect approaches, which uh, at least uh, relate some aspects of the solution of the real problem to the solution of more tractable, pro tractable problem. And uh, when it comes to a Benicio uh, um, approach in condensed matter, I think we have something like standard theory, which is density functional theory. So I will spend a few minutes at the beginning to uh, try to uh, uh, give a new, pr a different perspective on density functional theory that people usually give. Why? Because we want to combine it with dynamical mean field theory, and we need to write it in a common language in order to, uh, to uh, discuss the combination of the two. Now, uh, but first, very, very briefly, the, the, the density functional theory. So um, we are extremizing a functional of, electron, uh, of electron density only, rho, uh, in order to obtain, to obtain the ground state energy of the electron density. And uh, in order to, to uh, obtain ground state energy and electro electron density rho, and we can write down uh, this functional that has universal part and the material dependent part. And uh, then it's a, it's a very useful tool to introduce uh, so-called Consham orbitals, size, to discretize the problem. And then uh, we can exactly write down the kinetic part of the functional, and we can exactly write down the Hartree part of the functional, and then the rest is hidden, the rest, the complicated part, is hidden in this exchange correlation part of the functional. And very important, there is self-consistency condition on these, on these Consham orbitals, namely that they need to give the charge density. So in other words, we, we've written down uh, this theory in terms of self-consistent non-interacting problem. Now, uh, 
Of course, this functional, the interacting functional, is Hart 3 plus exchange correlation. And this exchange correlation function, of course, it's not known, very hard problem, very hard to solve. However, there are very, 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 very uh, reasonable uh, approximations available. And this local ansatz was actually written down uh, in the original paper by Kohn in his first paper, as far as I remember. Uh, and the, the, the ansatz is very easy. It's very, it's very simple. Namely, that energy density, this E exchange correlation, is energy density at each point in R depends only on the charge density at the same point. So it's very important, uh, which, which basically means that in order to calculate exchange correlation potential or exchange correlation energy, each point in space is independent of each other. Okay? That's as local as it can be, uh, as it can get. So completely local theory, which means that each point in space is independent of any other point in space in order to compute the exchange correlation potential. So that, of course, nowadays we are using slightly <clears throat> less local approximations in the sense that we are trying to add a little bit of gradient, which is, which is known as GGA and so on. But nevertheless, we have most of these DFT methods are relatively local in space in the sense that they, they have an ansatz similar to that. And we will show that actually dynamical mean field theory is a very similar analog to this, except that we're trying to uh, improve on this locality. We don't, we don't make the approximation as local as here, somewhat less local, and that, of course, makes approximation better. Why don't you factor out the role of Well, that's, a, that, that's the standard way. I mean, you don't need to, but because you want to call this uh, energy density rather than the uh, uh, energy density. So you want to, you want to divide, divide by rho the density at each point in space. It's just a you know, standard notation. But absolutely no need for it. But the important point is that this function is just a one-dimensional function. It's just uh, a curve, one-dimensional function. You, uh, you, you, you calculate this for one problem. And in this case, you can do it for Gillium uh, model. You do it for one problem. You tabulate it. Then you implement this in the code. And that's it. So your problem is now a problem of non-interacting particles. That's all that you're solving. Yes, it is a mean field theory. Yes, exactly. Yes. I mean, exchange correlation potential is written in terms of the total charge density, rho, isn't that? Not just exchange correlation energy in the main body states. In the way, well, how do you define the exchange correlation? Uh, uh, exchange correlation energy, of course, depends on your definition. I mean, you, we, can, we can write various theories, and the exchange, what is exchange correlation depends on what do you subtract from it. You're, you're absolutely right, I mean, what you're saying is that you want to treat the kinetic energy exactly. You don't want to approximate this one. You want to treat the heart rate term exactly. You don't want to make an approximation on it. You approximate only the last part. And that's very important. And we do the, exactly the same thing in DMFT. We don't want to approximate nabla square because it's a huge term. Right. Don't mess with it. You don't want to approximate heart rate term because it's a huge term. You don't want to mess with it. Actually, in many molecules, you don't want to approximate even the exchange term because <laughs> you, 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 you approximate only the, the correlation part. Yes, so absolutely essential. It's, it's important. Here, you see a DXT. And that actually contains some of the main body kinetic energy, even though we call it XT. That's sure. The point. Sure. But it's just a different point. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. Because kinetic energy is actually very complicated. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Okay. So uh, now, uh, yeah. So the the point is that this standard theory always uh, leads to rigid band picture in the sense that for each moment of k, we have a set of uh, energy levels, discrete energy levels e, e of k, and each uh, discrete energy level uh, has a full electron in, the, in it, in the sense that the the quasi-particle ionization amplitude z is one for each for each level, energy level. And in correlated systems, what happens is that actually this coherent part of the spectra is, uh, is usually a small fraction of the electron. One half, one third, in heavy fermions, only one hundredth of it. And so 99% uh, of the electron actually lives somewhere else in some incoherent part of the spectra. And that's something that uh, we want to model with the theory beyond density functional theory. Um, so electrons have dual nature. They're partly thinner and partly localized. In, in, in correlated systems. And in order for this, we need to incorporate the real space perspective. So electrons 
uh, are not treated just as waves. They, they localize due to Hubbard U, but even more important, uh, they, it leads to a very complicated physics of orbital differentiation where you have Hund's coupling. That's actually uh, a, recent, a recent development uh, in, in dynamical mean field theory. It turns out that <clears throat> in many, many materials, actually most of materials, the, inter the correlations come mostly due to Hund's coupling, not just due to U. U, U actually is very important when you have one hole or one electron. But when you have more holes and electrons, actually the Hund's coupling is more important than U. And it wasn't uh, received much attention at recently. Um, and uh, the, it turns out that the electron density rho, of, of course, is not quite good enough to describe the situation. So, um, and therefore, I'm going to switch the language a little bit. So we are going to now dis discuss uh, different approximations in this Latinger word functional language. Uh, it will turn out this is very useful because many known approximations can be, can be written in this, in this common framework. Okay? And then we can see how these different approximations uh, appear in this language. Now, this was written down a long time ago, 1950s. And the functional gamma here is a functional of the Green's function rather than charge density. So uh, the, the charge density, of course, is just, uh, is just the, uh, uh, the diagonal component of the Green's function. So we take the equal space and equal time components of the Green's function, gives your charge density. Uh, and uh, we write this uh, gamma of G, and we, uh, we are looking for the extremum of this functional. Okay? And the extremum of this functional give us the exact Green's function, and in the extremum, gamma becomes the free energy. Okay? So that, that's what was proven by uh, Lattigen and, uh, and Ward. Uh, and uh, one, can, one can see in a similar way that in standard theory, in density functional theory, that this part is universal functional, which depends uh, only on the propagator G and on the Coulomb interaction. And this part is material dependent in the sense that it has this external potential, which is the uh, uh, periodic potential in a solid. Now, uh, yeah, so we're looking for the extremum where uh, the, the derivative of gamma with respect to G is equal to 0. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this Latinger word functional is that this functional phi here is in principle known. Uh, at least in perturbation theory, we can define it. Of course, it's very hard to evaluate it in practice. And in very few, uh, few cases, uh, one could uh, numerically evaluate it. But at least in principle, in perturbation theory, we know how it looks like. Actually, it's, it's sum of all skeleton diagrams. Now, uh, what are the skeleton diagrams? You probably learned this in, 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 your, in your school. Uh, it's basically you rearrange perturbation theory in terms of dressed propagators, in terms of exact Green's function G, and your interaction U. And then you just write down uh, all, the, all the terms. Okay? And it turns out that they need to be uh, two particle reducible. Because if they, are, if they are two particle reducible, then you're double counting diagrams. Okay? So you just rewrite your perturbation theory in terms of fully dressed propagators. Okay? That's, all, that's all there is to it. Why is the extremum of this functional, why does it give you the exact? Ah, we will see in a second. Actually, the, the, phi, the phi is, is exactly defined in such a way that we know it gives the exact, the, the exact, uh, the exact Green's function. Why does it give the free energy? Uh, that's a little bit non-trivial proof that was proven in, in Abricoso's book a long time ago, in the 1970s, and so on. So, um, but so you're hiding the problem of finding the Green's function into finding the functional. Into finding this phi here, yes. Exactly, exactly. So, <clears throat> well, we will, now take the, we will now take the derivative of this. We will extremize this functional gamma. And what we're going to see is that from this term here, the, when you take derivative respect to g, we get g0 inverse. From this term here, we get g inverse. And from this one, we get delta phi or delta g. Okay? And this is what we need to set to 0, which actually you recognize that this is actually just a Dyson equation. Okay? So in other words, we, are, we, we, we just got the Dyson equation back where this delta phi or delta g is what we usually call self-energy. Okay? So now, if the phi is such that when we take the derivative with respect to g gives you the exact self-energy, well, then we get the exact Green's function in some sense trivial statement. Okay? Just the point is that we, this delta phi or delta g needs to give you the exact, the exact uh, self-energy. 
and it's written here. So this is, uh, this is the hard, hard rate term for the exact self-energy, the Hawk term, the second order term, and so on, so on and so forth, the infinity, isn't it? And of course, uh, the function of phi then needs to be such that when, it, when you cut, well, functional derivative means you cut uh, in all possible ways, these Green's functions, isn't it? And if you cut them in all possible ways, you cancel these prefactors here, this prefactor two, you cancel here prefactor two, you cancel here prefactor four, and you get term by term your exact self-energy, okay? And then in some sense, it's a restatement of the problem that this gives you the, the, uh, the Dyson equation, and delta phi or delta g gives you the exact self-energy. So it's the functional that gives you, in the stationarity, gives you the exact Green's function. Yes? Quick question. The prefactor on this last diagram is not one. Correct. Correct. I didn't, I mean, I just sketched the diagram and I didn't work it out, yes. But uh, one needs to work it out. One, two, three, four, five, six, probably, or something like that, yes. Sorry. Uh, okay. So, now, uh, it turns out, that, of course, for this functional, uh, for this functional phi, there are well-developed rules, of course, Feynman rules, they're very well known, and one can attempt to do diagrammatic Monte Carlo to sum this, all these diagrams up. And this is what, uh, for example, Prokofiev is, is doing, uh, is pursuing, uh, and uh, managed to, at least in some models, to sum all the diagrams uh, uh, up with Monte Carlo if the sign problem is not too severe, and that, in principle, can be done. Okay. Um, now, of course, in, in most of interesting problems, uh, this, to, to sum all the diagrams, is, is impossible, and we need to resort to some approximations. Yes? Can you say again why extremizing the functional is just a thing of cutting the diagram? Ah, so the, the, actually, the extre extremization of the functional here, of this gamma, gives you g0 inverse, g inverse, and so on, and also the derivative of phi with respect to g. Now, the derivative of phi with respect to g, you have this quantity here, and this thing here is g, and this thing here is g, and all these propagators are g, see this g? So therefore, when you take the derivative with respect to g, it's equivalent to cut it. I mean, you can write down the expression, take functional derivative, you see it's equivalent to cut this line. Well, just removing, yeah, removing, actually. Okay, you can say removing, actually, that's probably more accurate, yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Um, okay. So um, yeah. So th there are various useful approximations that now can be seen in a in a common language in this in this in this uh, uh, Latin Jewel theory. For example, you can write down the hartree fock theory, and the hartree fock theory is equivalent to approximate phi functional with the first two graphs, the Hart the Hartree and the Fock. I'm a trivial. So you take the derivative, you get the usual expression for the hartree fox self-energy, okay? Now, uh, we can do the same with GW. <coughs> if, we do, if we take into account, if we take into account all bubbles, all bubbles, that approximation gives you so-called fully self-consistent GW. Not the G0, W0, and so on, but the fully self-consistent GW, okay? An RPA type of thing. Uh, and of course, this, this approximation, then GW can be seen as an approximation where we truncate in the space of Feynman diagrams, okay? Not in real space, but in space of Feynman diagrams, just like hartree fock is cutting in the space of Feynman diagrams. You just decide that this, these are the diagrams I wanna, I wanna include, Feynman diagrams. Now, the DFT can also be uh, cast in this, in this language, but of course, in this case, the phi functional is not, uh, is not uh, uh, expressed in terms of the the Feynman diagrams, but it's just, it turns out that the phi functional then has to be the sum of Hartree term of rho and exchange correlation of rho, okay? So in other words, if I replace phi with E Hartree plus E exchange correlation of rho, rho the one that's used in, in DFT, it turns out that this leads to exactly the same equations as the standard density functional theory, okay? Now let me, let me uh, uh, lead you through the proof, it's actually pretty simple. So we write the Latin word functional just like before, G0 inverse minus G inverse plus G, trace log minus G, and then we add here E Hartree plus E exchange correlation. This is now our functional. And then we need to, in order to get the equations for this approximation, we need to uh, find the stationarity of the functional, isn't it? So we, 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 take, the, we take the derivative with respect to G, and the, so this first term give us G0 inverse, this gives you G inverse, and the derivative of this gives you the derivative of E Hartree plus E exchange correlation with respect to G, isn't it? And that, this kind of derivative we can do. That's very simple. So <clears throat> E exchange correlation with respect to G is the same as E exchange correlation with respect to rho times rho 
derivative of rho with respect to g, isn't it? And what is the derivative of rho with respect to g? Well, we look at the definition here, and we see the derivative of rho with respect to g just gives you the Green's function, the delta functions. Okay? So what we get is the d exchange correlation with respect to g is actually the exchange correlation potential, the usual exchange correlation potential of the DFT times this delta functions, which means that the potential is actually static in time, isn't it? It's completely static and it's also completely local. Okay? So just a relatively trivial statement. Why so why Uh, no, I did it, actually, because, you see, I, I, I took the derivative d exchange correlation with respect to rho, this one, and this, by definition, is v exchange correlation. That's how it's called. d e exchange correlation with respect to rho is actually v exchange correlation of rho. That's just the definition. That's a standard definition within density functional theory. I should have explained that. Isn't rho, if your g is a time-ordered Green's function? Correct. Isn't rho a particular time-ordering? Time yes, it is. So how does that it, it is, actually. The, the point is that it has to be tau minus tau prime plus i delta. One has to be a little... Yes, yes. But actually, the way I think of it here is, is uh, done on imaginary time. It's a little bit more convenient to think of this on imaginary time. And then you don't need to think, think about i delta here. So time means imaginary time. Uh, OK, so... Um, yeah, so we have, we have the statement now. The, the, that's the, the Dyson equation. G0 inverse minus G inverse is, is the sum of Hartree plus exchange correlation as a function of rho. And it's completely static and completely local in space. Okay? Now, of course, this leads to exactly the DFT equations. Why? Well, we can insert now G0 in here, isn't it? And express the G inverse. That's a trivial uh, mathematical manipulation. So I just insert G0 in here. And then I get, for g inverse, I get, I get this equation. Uh, and there is surface is a condition which requires that rho is, of course, the diagonal part of g, isn't it? And then uh, I can also uh, write this in terms of Matsubara sum, isn't it? So equal time means the same as Matsubara sum over i, i omega, standard, standard manipulation. So I get rho is this. And then in order to make further progress, we want to into, we, we want to discretize the problem. Discretize the problem, and the way you discretize the problem, well, you, you uh, write this problem in terms of some discrete orbitals, isn't it? And discrete orbitals turn out to be quantum orbitals. So you, you write this problem here in terms of quantum orbitals, and then you can invert this problem here, inverse of the Green's function, conveniently, isn't it? It's this, trivial. And then, uh, well, you can calculate rho from this. Of course, it's 1 over i omega g. And that gives you the Fermi function. And then, finally, we see that rho is exactly computed <coughs> as a uh, density of non-interacting system. And at the same time, we need to solve this eigenvalue problem. These are exactly DFT equations. Okay? So in other words, we, 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 uh, we, we saw that uh, if, we replace, if we replace phi with E hard plus exchange correlation of rho, then in Lattinger word theory, we get exactly the DFT uh, DFT equations. Now, however, there is an important difference between the exact DFT and be between this DFT that we derived here. Okay? Why? Because the DFT, if we knew the exact exchange correlation of rho, then DFT would be exact. Okay? But in this language, it would never be exact. It's always an approximation for the Green's function. Okay? So, uh, why? Because we know that this functional actually has to depend on the, on the full Green's function, not, ju not just on the, on the density. Uh, and we also, when, we, when you look at the expansion, we see that this, these, two are, these two functions are different. So in this language, DFT does not appear as an exact, an exact theory. But nevertheless, it's a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a reasonable approximation for the Green's function. At least we know that for the weakly interacting systems, this, uh, this uh, 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 Hartree plus exchange correlation is a reasonable theory for, uh, for phi. Ah, well, it's a long experience of the community. It's actually, we know DFT should give you just only reasonable total energies. But it turns out that it gives very reasonable band structures. Okay? Uh, by comparing to experiment for various materials, which are weakly correlated, we know that the band structure looks actually very, very good. Okay? Uh, I don't, I don't have a good explanation, actually, to be honest. I don't. Well, the only explanation is that the, the correlations are local. 
uh, you can see this in, in, any, ex in any example you, you wish. I mean, correlations are pretty local in space. And therefore, local ansatz uh, is expected to be reasonable. Now, the fact that completely local ansatz, just LDA, is so good is a big surprise, in my opinion. I wouldn't expect that. I would say that at least the locality in real space shouldn't be exactly locality to a point, but locality in some larger region. But uh, it turns out in practice that it works so well. For, at least for weakly correlated systems. It, it really, band structure agrees with the experiment very well. OK. Um, yeah, so, but, but it turns out that actually LDA or, or, or GGA are not so good when we have coexistence of narrow and wide bands. So it turns out because the, 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 the exchange correlation potential depends only on the total density, not on the density of the, of the narrow bands and of the, weak, of the uh, itinerant bands, it turns out that uh, DFT actually is, is pretty bad when you have coexistence of the very different types of, of states, both correlated and, and both strongly correlated and weakly correlated. So in this case, it's actually pretty bad. And uh, in order to um, make some progress in this, in this area, actually at that time the big, the big problem was uh, the mode transition in the Hubbard model. So it was uh, in 1980s and 1990s, there was a lot of effort to understand the mode transition in the Hubbard model because it was, it was a, as, as a, a first order transition between the metal and between the paramagnetic insulator, and there was no good theory to describe that. Okay, and the DMFT was developed for that by uh, several people, but uh, I will emphasize the contribution of Gabby Kotler and Antoine George, when they realized that, uh, that local correlations on a given site can be calculated exactly. So that's their big contribution. Local correlations on a given site can be calculated exactly. Uh, by mapping the lattice problem into a problem of quantum impurity. Now, um, I will first, first give a very brief historic introduction uh, how this was uh, derived, but I'm not going to derive it. We're going to later on uh, see this in, uh, uh, in functional language. So how does it look like in functional language? Okay, so uh, the, the important point is that this, uh, uh, this was derived by analogy to the Weiss-Minfield theory for spin systems. And actually works in a very similar way as Weiss-Minfield uh, uh, theory for spin systems. If we have spin system where there are, there are lots of, where each spin interacts with lots of nearest neighbors, when connectivity z goes to infinity, then we can approximate the influence of all other spins on a single spin with, with an effective magnetic field, isn't it? Effective magnetic field. And the important point is that at this point, when we, when we calculate this Weiss field here, B, bi, then we have a completely local problem. So this problem is a problem of a single spin Local spin, single spin in a magnetic field. And that's, of course, is very simple to, to calculate. Now, in a similar way, in dynamical mean field theory, we replace the, la the lattice problem with the problem of a single atom immersed into the medium. Okay? And the way this mapping works is the following. Uh, we are going to derive this later on with, with, uh, with the functional point of view. But the way this mapping, mapping works is the following. We need to make sure that our auxiliary uh, impurity problem has exactly the same local Green's function has exactly the same Green's function as the local Green's function of the lattice, and interaction on the impurity has to be exactly the same as inter local interaction on the site. Then it turns out that self energy of the impurity is the same as the local self energy or of your lattice problem. Okay, so this is this is the so-called DMFT circular condition. Um, now, of course, one can, one can write this specific self condition for various models. That, that's how it, so historically this was introduced. But what we want to do here is we want to discuss uh, this in terms of latin word functional. Okay? And um, what we do in, in this approximation is that we approximate the phi functional with a functional which, is, which depends only on the local Green's function. That's crucial. So we see the similarity with density functional theory. In density functional theory, we want to write the phi functional, which is the functional only of the local, uh, only of the density, which is local in 3D space, rho delta of r, r minus r prime. Here, we want to do it in terms of Green's function, which is local to a site, GII, because we are talking about lattice model now. We're going to generalize this later on for the continuous model. But the point is that we want to write a functional 
which contains only the, those Green's functions that's, that start at certain site and end at the same site, the local ones. Okay? That's the dynamic mean field theory. And of course, because uh, th this breaks up into, into independent sites, we need, to, we need to sum over all sites. Okay? So that's what we write. On, on, on each site, yes. But, well, actually, it has frequency dependent, uh, dependence, and it has dependence on all the degrees of freedom on the atom mm -hmm. or on the cluster, whatever you have. And, uh, for example, the typical. Well, it, won't have it won't have, well, it has real space dependence. Oh. So it has real space dependence, just like in DFT. You know, uh, the exchange creation potential doesn't have K dependence, it has real space dependence. Similar here, everything has real space dependence, but not K dependence. The K dependence comes when you invert the Dyson equation. That's the big, the big point. So in analogy with the, with the density functional theory. Now, in order to do the same thing, we'll discuss the five-functional later on. But in this case, we know exactly what the five-functional is. Now, uh, for continuous problems, we need to do a similar thing. Namely, we need to define something that we call projector. Okay? Why? We, we need to take the full Green's function. We need to project this Green's function to a given site, Ri. And then we write the functional as a functional on all of this projected Green's function. So the important point is to define the projector. Once you define the projection, projector, DMFT is, uh, is defined. Okay? But of course, the unfortunate thing in DMFT is that it depends on the projector. Okay? So of course, if you, have, if you take a very, very large projector, which goes through many, many sites, then you're basically doing the problem exactly. Okay? Uh, if you take smaller and smaller projector, usually what we do is we just take a single site, then this is an approximation, but it's a reasonable approximation because it, it goes way more, it's way less localized than density functional theory, for example, which has projector to a given point in 3D space. Okay? So, but definitely we need the projector, and therefore the DMFT is projector dependent method, which you use different projector, gets slightly different answer. So we hope uh, to, uh, well, to discuss what is an optimal choice for the projector. Okay? Projector dependent approximation. Now, uh, to give some overview, um, so in density functional theory, what we do is in order to calculate ex uh, uh, energy, uh, electron electron correlation potential, we map each point by point, po point by point in 3D space to a problem of electron gas. Okay? That's what we are, we are doing, actually. And what we want to do in DMFT, is to lift this restriction a little bit and say that we are, instead of mapping each point in 3D space uh, to an electron gas problem, we want to point, e we want to map each atom, let's say, okay, to a quantum impurity problem, okay? So we want to lift this restriction, not point by point, but actually atom by atom, maybe cluster by cluster, but cluster is very expensive to do nowadays. But uh, hopefully in, 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 in a few years, even cluster is going to be, is going to be easy. Now, um, what I said is the <clears throat> now in, in DMFT, you have to define what your projector is. Once you define that, you can write your phi. And the, the point is, we know what this functional is. Okay? In DMFT, we don't make further approximations on the functional. What, what this functional is, is actually is the sum of all skeleton local diagrams. Okay? So in other words, we write exactly the same expression for the di diagrammatic expression as before for the exact system, for the full system. And now we just restrict this propagator here instead of being anything, any non-local propagator that starts with i and ends at any, any other j, we restrict it to i, i only. Okay? So that's our approximation. So wherever, whenever in the exact expression we had the full Green's function g, we now restrict it to certain site i, i. That's our approximation for the functional. Okay? And the reason why you don't suffer from the sign problem, when, when you try to do this for the whole yes. problem, you have a sign problem, right? Uh, yes, yes. Well, why the sign problem it turns out? Well, it, it, it depends on how you do your uh, quantum Monte Carlo. It turns out that, for example, if you do it from weak coupling point of view, it almost always has a sign, except for a one-band model. Whenever you have Hund's coupling, it already uh, a sign problem comes out. If you do so-called strong coupling uh, Monte Carlo, then at least for single site, uh, there are many times, uh, well, for the D systems, for example, there's almost no sign problem, except when you have some off-diagonal hybridization or you have some, uh, some um, uh, 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 spin-over coupling, it, the, sign up, the sign might come up. 
Okay? But uh, there, there is no generic proof when the sign will pop up and when it will not. So it's hard, case by case. Yes? Uh, question. Uh, here you said that you can write down exactly the DMT perturbation expansion. Yes. Uh, and in this expansion, you only have local green zone. Correct. Uh, that you also have only local interactions. Correct. Uh, so is that a requirement or it just. It well, the, the, the interaction has to be projected on the same real space as the Green's function, okay? Because in your, in your perturbation expansion, you on, only have local Green's function, so the, the only interaction that you have then is between these local degrees of freedom. That's so, all. So let's say you have a Hamiltonian that has happened to have non-local interaction as well. Uh, you can do give a T by doing this with only local interaction. Well, all, non all the non-local all the non-local parts are treated, can, can be treated in mean field theory, okay. uh, just like in, in, in DFT. Everything that's that's beyond this range, it's not treated dynamically; it's treated statically within mean field. Okay, so it's not so bad, <laughs> at least as good as in the, static, in the in the in the standard theories. Okay, so again, this trick is actually used only uh, for the dynamic part. Uh, that, that's very important to emphasize. Actually, for example, the the heart term, we almost never truncate to the to local to the local level because it's this, uh, heart term is so easy to calculate that we can always do it exactly. Now, the rest of the terms and exchange, for example, the rest of the terms, of course, we uh, tend to approximate because it's very hard to calculate them exactly. Okay, so what we do then is we write this functional, uh, the ansatz. Uh, the DMFT ansatz for the functional, we approximate this phi as a sum over all i that contains only the local Green's function. And the point is this is non-functional. Uh, now, uh, you see that the similarity with, DFT, with the density functional theory again. So in density functional theory, we write this exchange correlation as an integral over the exchange correlation density. Now, I didn't use rho here, but I just use E exchange correlation like this. And, uh, uh, you see this, this truncation here is truncation to the same r and to the same tau, okay? So it's very similar in some sense. We also truncate to the same point in 3D space to the same time, okay? Uh, depends only on the charge density rho. So this DMFT is less restrictive than that. Um, sorry, I have a question about previous slide. Uh, uh, I'm a little confused. Is our eyes pointing space or are they... Yes, so I'm switching now a little bit between the lattice model and between the continuous model. So this I here is actually, this I here is meant to be, uh, uh, to be an atom in real space, an atom in real space. Not in the same point, the same atom in space. So the same atom. So what, what, I, what I had in mind here is like this. You see, you have the same atom in space. So you look at this, this tank, and you, you, the, here is like uh, transition metal, ox, transition, transition metal uh, in here in the middle. And you map this into a local problem which w with, at the site I. And I call this I, the atom. With different points, yeah, within the same atom, yes. Everything, everything within the same atom is calculated exactly, okay? Everything within the atom. But what is beyond the atom is treated with mean, mean field. Okay. That's the idea. So, Christian, just to be sure, the last diagram for example, uh, in this, uh, the diagram, the last diagram, yes, you see, I see like 12 eyes. They are all going to be exactly the same atom. Correct. Everything local. Okay. Nothing, nothing goes out of local. I mean, similar than in DFT. I mean, DFT, you always, Truncate to density, the same R. No, well, when you add the gradient, then of course you relax this a little bit, but still, gradient is, is very nearby points in space. Here, it's everything to the same, the same atom, but of course, atom is not so small, isn't that? Uh, so for LDA, the R and R prime are actually the spatial, the spatial position. Correct. It's not just the same atom. Exactly, that's, exact, that's, that's the point, that's the crucial point. In, 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 in DFT, or in LDA actually, in LDA, not in DFT, in, in LDA it's exactly the same point in space. And here it's, here's the same atom in space, or if you want, the same cluster in space, if you, you can do cluster if you want. Yes? Uh, uh, once you form the edges in the functional form, then mm -hmm. it's very tempting to think about the, the implication in, in uh, Bayer Meccano's conservation model, right? Yes, uh, actually it's conserving, that's the right. point. So, so I you should emphasize that. Many times, uh, you and Xavier and Antoine, so, but is, is it obvious that this is 
Yes, yes that, that, was, that was shown by, uh, by McAdano, actually, in this seminal work in 1960s or something. So whenever you can write it in terms of the functional like this, in a closed form with a functional, where the phi is well defined, then it's relatively straightforward. You take a few derivatives with respect to time and with respect to mass and respect to various things, and you can see that it's conserving. Conserving even, even though when you calculate the correlation function, you are taking the derivative or second derivative of not yeah. local green function. Yes. Yes, of course, of course. That, that's, that's, what's proved. That's, that's what was proven by Bam Candano. So as long as you have a functional that you can write down, it's conserving. Of course, if I, if I included part of this functional and somehow you know, fudge with the functional, when I do, for example, uh, not the fully self-consistent GW, but G0, W0, or GW0, or anything like that, you see, it looks like there exists a functional, but you don't put here the full G, but you put G0. Then it's, then it's not, it's not conserving anymore. But as long as this, these are the exact Green's functions, it's conserving. But what's not clear to me is that this Green's function is like you truncate the full Green's function. Into yes. Full power, right? Yes. So by when you take functional derivative, you're supposed to take the full Green's function. Yes. Derivative. Yes, we do this so all the time. Yes. Not exactly the same way that when Ben kind of. No, it is. It is. It is. The, the proof goes through. Let's look into it. I've done it, suppose, a couple of times. Yes. Ah, what's conserving means that, um, um, that uh, for example, the, the, uh, the, charge, the charge density uh, of this local object is going to be the same as the density of, the, of your system, for example. So the conservation of charge, conservation of, uh, of what else, uh, energy, and so on. So there are various conservation laws uh -huh. that you, that you want to... It's not that the energy is the same, it's that it's conserved in the same way. Exactly. So when you have to satisfy the equation of continuity. Yeah. The charge, continuity, yes. Continuity, charge, yes. So you have to convert them in two particle chains, right? The particle correlation function needs to satisfy continuity. That's very difficult to do in equation theory. Mm -hmm. And question. So suppose I start with LDA and then I just somehow broaden the delta function in R and R prime to atomic size. Would I just get the MSP? The question is, how would you broaden? I mean, that's the problem. I mean, the point is that it, in DFT, you can map point by point into an into a electron gas problem. But when you broaden it in real space, I don't know how you figure out what's your exchange correlation potential. So no, no, no clear way to do it in this way, I think. Uh, OK. So. Uh, yeah, so the point is that we need to sum all these infinite set of diagrams, but everywhere we have the Green's, local Green's function, I, 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 I. I means a site now. And the point is, this was the important contribution of Antoine George and Gabi Kotler, where they figure out that this infinite sum of diagrams can be calculated with solving quantum impurity problem. Okay? Quantum impurity problem is not a trivial problem still, but at least it's easier than the original problem. Okay? Um, what is quantum impurity? Well, the quantum impurity is where you have a single site which is interacting, and it's coupled to an infinite bath of conduction electrons. Okay? That's the quantum impurity. So in only one site being interacting. Okay? One site being interacting, which means that, of course, the only Feynman diagrams that you draw will always start at the interacting site and end at the interacting site, doesn't it? Okay? So it's clear that it will have these diagrams. But let, let's go through this. So for, for the quantum impurity problem, we can write we can write a similar uh, uh, Latin word functional, trace log G impurity, everything is impurity now, and phi and G impurity, okay? And now this phi is the one that you're searching for. This is the phi, it turns out it's the same phi as the one for the DMFT, okay? So how do you see that? Well, um, you see, <clears throat> how do I see that? Well, I need all these local diagrams. Everything starts at I, ends at I, okay? But when I, do the DM, when I do the quantum impurity problem, I have only one site which is interacting. Only one site. Of course, this interacting site has to look exactly the same as, as my uh, original problem from the lattice. So in other words, it has to have exactly the same interaction, U, than the original problem. And it has to have exactly the same propagator. In other words, the Green's function, the propagator, the Green's function of the impurity has to be exactly the same as the local Green's function on the lattice. And once, once I satisfy that all these lines here on the impurity and on the lattice are exactly the same, then 
when I calculate the self-energy of, of the impurity, which is the sum, is exactly the same as the self-energy that I need in the MFT. It's obvious, isn't it? These are exactly the diagrams that the impurity, uh, that, 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 are, that give you exact solution of the impurity. Okay? So if I can sum up all the diagrams for the impurity, I have all the local diagrams that are needed in the MFT. That's all. Okay? Very simple statement. So uh, now, <clears throat> uh, uh, the DMFT function, of course, is different than the function of the, of the impurity. We, we wrote before the function of the impurity looks like this. So everywhere we have impurity quantities, impurity, impurity, impurity. And of course, this part of the functional here has nothing to do with DMFT. The only thing that, we, that has to do with DMFT is this phi, this Feynman diagram. So that all the rest, of course, is just um, something that we, we don't want when they get rid of it. So, Uh, well, it's, uh, the impurity in t is interacting only on a single site. It has U only on a single site, interacting. Is it a single site in a single point, or it's like a single site of the atom? It's an atom. It's an atom. It's an atom. Here it's meant to be an atom. So uh, typically, in these systems, you have five orbitals. Okay? And in F systems, you have seven orbitals. So it's an atom in real space that has some radius. Yes? In the previous slide, uh, you write down the pattern that impurity function. And it only involves the green function and interaction of the impurity. Correct. Now, the interaction part, I, I can see. But why is that a, 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 a impurity problem considered a problem with single impurity? Mm -hmm. Naively, I would have thought the functional is actually a, 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 a full green function. Correct. The functional of a full green function with impurity. Correct. In it, right? Correct. Very important. Why is that here? It's very good. Very good. Perfect. <laughs> so it turns out that there is a trivial term here, which we always drop, which is the trace log of G conduction bath. So in addition to this, there is trace log G conduction bath, which we always throw out because we are looking only on the, on the addition when you add the impurity to the, to the bath. Okay? So there is a trace log G of the bath, but because bath is only interacting, it's integrated out. And we always throw it out. Okay? It's a trivial term, it's a trivial constant that we never cared about. Trace log G of the bath. Uh, for many that the phi function doesn't mm -hmm. care about Everything else. Correct, correct. That, that's exactly correct. That's the the rest is a trivial constant, throw it out. The same in the action. Okay. Uh, so, what do you choose to be the bath does not matter? Uh, well, it, it matters a lot, a lot in order to, uh, to get this satisfied. Because, yeah. how do you get satisfied that the local Green's function is the same as G impurity? You need to have a bath. That's absolutely essential. And also, when you do the simulation, it's actually absolutely essential to have the bath. But when you write the Feynman diagrams like that, the bath drops out because the only thing that it matters is actually the Green's function in the, uh, in the propagator. The only thing that matters in Feynman expansion is the propagator. So everything can be cast into the language of the local Green's function. So there G is supposed to be the full G, not the, Correct. the real, real propagator Correct. on the site. Correct. Correct. The real propagator on the site. OK. Um, now the DMFT functional here uh, is, cont contains the full G here, G inverse, G0 inverse of your original problem. And then this approximation for the phi functional, isn't it? Which is the local. And then we, we extremize. So now, now I'm working for the lattice model. This is for the, for the lattice model with i, j, k, and so on means lattice sites, isn't it? And then when you, when you extremize this functional here, you get g0 inverse, g inverse from this part. And then here, you see when you take the derivative, you, have, you get this delta functions in here. So it means that the, <coughs> this, is, this is the self energy, isn't it? So the self energy in this case is going to be fully local. Uh, in space for the, la for the lattice problem. So kind of trivial statement, isn't it? Uh, so in other words, sigma impurity. So this thing, this thing is going to be computed as sigma impurity. And we see now that sigma impurity is the same as the local sigma for the lattice. That's what this Lattenjord uh, functional gives you. OK, now in continuous, in, in continuous problem, we, I said before, we need to define this, this uh, projector. Without the projector, there is no DMFT. Okay? Why? Because what means local? <laughs> That's the problem. It's a local approximation, but for which local object? Okay? So you need to define what your local object is. Okay? And, but once you define this propagator, then, the, the, sorry, propagator, this projector to the, for the Green's function, all the math goes through. Okay? We know exactly what DMFT is. So 
Uh, now, in order to make further progress, to, to write this in terms of some, uh, some discrete problem that we can handle on a computer, we need to discretize the projector. So this projector here, which is meant to be an operator, now needs to be written in terms of some orbitals, alpha, beta, for example, orbitals, isn't it? or some degrees of freedom, alpha, beta, and uh, uh, the, the, the projector then for the Green's function will be integral over RR prime, uh, where this uh, P will have some orbital degrees of freedom, alpha, beta. Now, <clears throat> for concreteness, I'm writing here uh, sim the most simple projector where these phi functions are some localized functions on, on an atom, okay? So I have some discrete localized functions on an atom that probably form the full uh, complete space, complete basis on the atom, for example, you can do that. And now this is an example of so-called separable projector. In general, it turns out the projector does not need to be separable. Uh, it turns out that this, um, uh, we can prove uh, the DMFT equations are uh, causal for separable projection. For non-separable, we don't know if that works out, but it turns out we have examples where it's non-separable, but it works out. DCA is so-called approximation, where you cannot write it as separable, but nevertheless, the equations can be proven to be causal. So if the projector is non-separable, you have to check case by case if it leads to causal equations. It turns out that if it doesn't lead to causal equation, then uh, the whole scheme will break down, and it's uh, not, not useful. Uh, OK, so we have a basis. now. Once, once, you, once we define this projector here, from now on I'm going to call it P of Ri, which is, which is written in some discrete basis, alpha, beta. Once you have this, uh, this written down, then you apply it to the Green's function, and you get, so here, here it's written, you get the G local. So G local is uh, integral of this pr projector times Green's function or, or the full space. So this is what we call G local. And then you, you insert this into your phi. That's the approximation that we're doing. So phi is a function of this G local only. And in order to, to get the equations, you need to take the derivative with respect to full G. So how do you do that? Well, when you take the derivative with respect to full G, you have to take the derivative with respect to G local times the derivative of G local with respect to G, isn't it? So when we take the derivative with respect to the G local, we get this. And then you have to take the derivative of G local with respect to G. So how do you take the derivative of G local with respect to G? You get this P here, okay? So I'm just taking the derivative with respect to full G and I get this P here, okay? Yes? Sorry, I don't understand why it's easier to take the derivative of phi with respect to G local. Why that makes it easier? Ah, uh, well, because this thing, we, are, we recognize that this is sigma local and this thing can be simulated with, with a quantum impurity problem. You see, this is now discrete problem in indices alpha, beta, and corresponds to exactly quantum impurity. That's all, okay? So this is known. G local divided by delta phi G local with respect to DG, G local is exactly the same as DG impurity with respect to G impurity, where we make sure that G local is the same as G, the G impurity, okay? So in other words, this thing here, this object, can be computed exactly with quantum impurity problem, okay? okay? It's discrete problem defined for uh, 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 defined on, on for, for a given orbital alpha beta. Okay. Now, so this is the solution of quantum impurity, and then this thing, of course, is this uh, what we call embedding. Okay. So, notice a very important fact. We define projector first. This projector here, which brings you from the Green's function written in the lattice to local Green's function. Now, the same projector also appeared here. See? What does it mean? It means that if I can calculate self-energy for the quantum impurity, this tells me how do, how do I embed self-energy of the quantum impurity into the real space, into the big Hilbert space, okay? Because now you see this quantity here is sigma of r prime. This is the self-energy in real space, okay? This is my self-energy in real space. And that's, if, I, if I embed it with the same uh, with the same projector or the same matrix elements of the projector, I'm going to see that this gives you the stationary DMFT equations. Okay, so that's the best way to do it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so we see the embedding. Uh, once more, I'm going to restate this. So, this part is the solution of the quantum impurity model. Okay at site Ri. Of course, you can have many different sites and you, you, need, you can solve many different impurity problems for each site, this site, next site, third site. All inequivalent problems require a new quantum impurity solution, which we can do. And then 
we see that, the, that the, these equations here, this equation, the, this stationarity equations, actually require, uh, give you the Dyson equation and tell you how do you get self-energy from this uh, solution of the quantum impurity. So in other words, this sigma local is the solution of quantum impurity, and this thing tells you how do you get self-energy in a big Hilbert space, in real space, okay? And once you have the self-energy in real space, written like this, then, well, you have the standard Dyson equation, and, uh, well, you, uh, you, you, you get the exact Green's function, well, you get your approximation for the Green's function from knowing QG0, isn't it? So, quite straightforward. So, to summarize this, this, this part, so if we, if we have the, the, the Green's, our best approximation for the, for the Green's function in nearest space, we first project to local degrees of freedom, whatever we believe is <coughs> important is the local degrees of freedom. Then we, we use our impurity solver to calculate self-energy for this local degrees of freedom, okay, for discrete orbitals alpha beta. Once we have that, we embed back the self-energy. An important point is that this embedding is done with the same matrix elements, P of, of the projector, the same matrix elements enter. So there is no freedom here. You embed, you get the self-energy. And once you have the self-energy, you just uh, uh, do the, the usual Dyson equation. Isn't that Dyson equation? Same, the same thing as in DFT, uh, to get the Green's function. And that's the self-consistent loop that one needs to solve. Yes? If you had a system with some molecular characters, such as copper oxide, iron, polyacetylene, or something, yes? would you be in trouble with this, or would you? Uh, there are regimes where you might get in trouble, and there are regimes where it actually works very well. I think I will show H2 molecule as an example. H2 molecule, you would expect this will break down. Right. And we'll see where it breaks down and where it doesn't break down. So which, where, where, this, where this is wallet. Yep. Over? Over. OK. Mm -hmm. So then I guess we're going to continue in a few minutes. Yeah. All right. Uh, Questions? I had a question. Uh, okay. Can you use this for a disordered yes. system? So yes. Doesn't translational symmetry is not at all? Important. Not at all. So all that you need to do is to define your projector for each site, uh -huh. and then you have this, you just solve the Dyson equation. I mean, you have to invert the Dyson equation, right. which might be complicated for a disordered but system. You never use but translational symmetry anywhere. In no. Discussion. No. Absolutely unnecessary. In fact, the non setting version of this framework is exactly what he invented to, be, to describe error. Exactly, yeah. 30 years ago. 30 years ago, so yeah. The human potential transmission. Yeah, CPA, uh, yeah. Exactly the same framework designed to handle disorder problems. Mm -hmm. You can handle disorder problem very well, except it doesn't have multiple scattering problems, but in pure. It doesn't cause any sense of vibration. Yeah. Otherwise, give you a pretty good result. Okay. All right, shall we take a break? break.